and I'm getting mighty tired of your trifling ways and of listening to that jackass Bray. Frustrated and over everything and everybody. I'm damn near sick of this industry all the way together. Like, I don't give a fuck about being famous. I really could give a shit. Um, comedy is something that I'm definitely going to do for the rest of my life because it's something that I want to do and it gives me joy and pleasure, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I, I really don't give a fuck about other people's standards, what uh, channels I got to go through, the people. I, got. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a shit. And I have been so ostracized, so hurt, so betrayed, so pissed off by so many people. Like, I just, you know, um, want to recover and rebuild at my own pace. You know, I just want to do things that fill me with joy, fill me with peace. Um, I want to do things that fill my pocket so that I'll never have to be this broke again, so that I'll never have to be treated like I'm not a human being ever again. You know, it's bad enough being in this country and being black. I mean, if I could just be frank, you know, we just don't have the, the same shot at justice and opportunity as, you know, many of our white counterparts. But you can't be black and be broke or financially challenged because then you're vulnerable to, you know, injustice and mistreatment pretty much from everywhere you turn. And then they'll justify it and, and quickly turn you into, you know, a vile caricature that's far from the reality of who you are. Um, the last three years of my life have been very hard. I've been trafficked by police over 11 times due to a lot of crooked men with big bank accounts uh, and perverted tendencies and secrets, you know? And due to, you know, me having enough- I don't appreciate being approached and disturbed. Well, we got a call back to do I don't, I didn't do anything. I just got here. You know, I, I do what you I, it's all, it's all ready. Hey, I'm gonna Look, explain this to you, okay? Listen to me. I don't need you to explain you're anything to, to me. I'm not going to give you my ID. ID. I'm leaving. Okay. You're under arrest. I'm not under arrest. I'll give you the ID. 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 I'll give you in in the efforts of me pursuing my dreams and just trying to do what I love without their bullshit impeding my life. Um, I went on a Twitter rant back in September 2017. That account has since been deleted because the motherfuckers paid Jack Dorsey off to keep shutting down my account because money runs everything. And like I said, it's, it's been hard for me to not turn into a callous person where all I care about is getting money because that's all everybody ever reduced me to, a fucking dollar symbol. Um, it's taken everything in me to try to balance things out with my spiritual side and um, operate you know, from a higher place. Um, since I've been surrounded by so much toxic, low vibrational energy. And it's been frustrating also to be constantly harassed by number one strangers, but people that will do anything for an opportunity or people that will accept dark money under the table to, you know, stalk you, watch you, follow you, and all of those things. This has been the reality of my life, you guys, since October 2017. Um, I'm a part of a federal investigation, and the beach could be told, not quite sure who exactly launched it, but, you know, the president is involved. Um, and a lot of key players in Hollywood. Um, Weinstein is involved. Uh, a lot of people are involved. And no one ever sat down and talked to me. You know what I'm saying? Nobody ever broke down to me what was happening and why. In fact, uh, I pretty much lost contact with everybody over this shit. And there was a whole lot of people I had to weed out and cut out of my life because I saw that they were you know, uh, snakes, basically. Um, it's been very hard to trust. In the past year, I've been in a situation where I've been getting investigated by the federal government over some bullshit that has nothing to do with me. And it has led to my phone being hacked, me being followed every fucking where I go, um, my financial information being compromised, and, uh, being compromised and ran through, and then just having to deal with all of these situations, like the one I'm about to currently explain that I'm in. And it's stupid. And it's only happening because I'm black, honestly. It's happening because I'm black and because I'm in love with a dark-skinned black man. Like, so here's a simple version of what's happening here right now. And I do mean anyone at this point in my life because I've been so badly betrayed and hurt by so many people I really loved. Few of them I would have died for. You know, it's just, it's not a fun place or position to be. Um, and a lot of it was due to people being in a hurry 
you know, to see me do bad or, you know, um, not wanting me to do well or um, just not liking me, you know, just deciding that I'm not their cup of tea and fuck that bitch, you know, wishing like harmful things on me. And I mean, you know, not everybody don't like us. I know that and I'm cool with that. But I never went out my way to try to harm, hurt or derail anybody ever. Um, even the people that I told the truth about, you know, in regards to, you know, uh, in regards to my sexual harassment, my rape, my uh, domestic violence. I told the absolute truth of those clowns. I ain't never take them to court. I ain't never, you know, do none of that. Not saying the people that do do those things aren't legitimately, you know, victims. But it was one of those things. I wanted to be so far removed from the pain that I didn't want no reminders of the shit. And because I know how people treat women and victims and all, I ain't want that energy. I ain't want that shit. I was already not liked to begin with. You know, I already had an uphill battle to climb to begin with. I don't want to add fuel to the fire. Uh-huh, see, we knew that bitch. And here's the deal. I still took the high road, I still put my work in, I still grinded it out, paid dues, gave opportunities, I did all that shit, and I still got hated and shit and all. So, you know, at this rate, I really, like I said, I don't, I don't care about none of this industry shit. I never really did. But, you know, I love the work that I do. I love being creative. I'm never gonna stop. Uh, I enjoy the creativity and the work of specific people, and I'm gonna continue to enjoy their work and, and watch their work and, you know, all of that. And I really don't feel like an opportunity that is for me has left me or I missed it. Like, I feel like this is an abundant universe and I'm going to get everything that's for me because it's for me. And things that I missed out on, the way I always look at it, well, it wasn't really for me. And rejection is God's protection. I mean, it sounds like, you know, like, you know, you say stuff like that, right? People be skeptical, like, oh yeah, right, bitch. You know you hurt, you know you big mad, you know, you know you mad. You, you just saying that because you want to be fake. But no, I really don't give a fuck. Like, and it's annoying to me how much people have tried to make me want to give a fuck. Here, let me delete something. Four seconds. This is an old notification that ain't been right. I ain't had no IMDB account since forever. I'm like, get that out of here. Anyway, um, I'm just, I'm like really over it. Like, I've never been a person that felt the need to run with a click in order to be important. Um, even though I did, you know, um, pursue Greek life at uh, a period of time. And it was for a lot of different reasons. It was for historical reasons. It was for uh, community reasons, cultural reasons. Um, but even then, when I didn't get the result that I wanted, an outcome that, you know, uh, would have much pleased me, I didn't become no hater or, you know what I mean? And I didn't feel like I missed nothing. I felt like, oh, well, this wasn't what I was supposed to be focused on. This ain't really what I'm supposed to do. And I'm, honestly, to be honest, you guys, I'm so grateful for my life. The more I'm so grateful to be alive and living um, because I'm like a cat with nine lives. Before all of this stuff happened that shook my world apart and made me feel like my, you know, my world was falling apart, I already had three um, brushes with death. And uh, you can listen to previous episodes to uh, go in depth about, you know, what that was about and I share those experiences. So, you know, uh, if this is your first time tuning in, you've never heard this podcast before, episode 63 is your first one. Go ahead and subscribe, anchor.fm slash aranos, Virgo Viewpoint, A-A-R-O-N-A-S, Virgo Viewpoint. And here's previous episodes, I go in depth about what that was about. And to all the people that have been following my journey, thank you so much for being a part of this podcast and, you know, continuing to show up and fuck with your girl. Uh, but y'all know, and so it is what it is. But yeah, um, and then in this experience, if you traffic over a little time, I've been beaten, yo. I mean, I'll never forget being beaten in a hotel in New York, January 3rd, 2018. Four officers, all guys, one female. And they, they frightened me. I went live on my then Instagram account. They used to have 60,000 followers or what have you. It was over 3,000 people in the live and they saw it, you know, with their own eyes, which probably saved my life because they really could have just slit my throat and did some shit, made up some bullshit, captioned, oh, I resisted arrest or whatever. You know, I could have got the Laquan McDonald treatment or some shit. But because I went live and 3,000 people saw it, they know people seen it. So if that was the last thing people seen and all of a sudden I'm dead, it's obvious who killed me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so the first thing that they did, they cut the Wi Fi in the hotel and then they all charged at me uh, at the same time. I'll never forget the image. That image is blurred in my brain of what the, the fear that I felt of all five of them charging toward me. And then they, like, they was fighting me for the phone. And um, this is for grown adults. One me, I'm 5'4". Think about all that physical strength on me. So, you know, when people sit up here and try to make these jokes and all of this stuff about me being whatever, it's like, no, bitch, I'm physically fit. And uh, to the point that people think they fucking with a superhuman when they try to try me physically. It took all five of them just to try to get my phone. And one uh, uh, officer was handling me so roughly, I kicked him in the dick. He punched the fuck out of me in the face. They left like a mark on my chin for like, two, three months after. They strapped me to a stretcher. They, they tried to, you know, your family told us that you're on meds. I've never taken meds a day in my fucking life. But what the fuck am I supposed to say? There's four officers here and y'all strapping me to a fucking stretcher. I don't know where the fuck y'all taking me. Y'all not telling me where y'all taking me. That's scary in itself. And I show up and I'm in the basement of this weird looking building. I didn't even know I was in a hospital. I didn't know where the fuck I was. Next to some white man that looks to be about old with white hair in a trench coat. You know, get like slacks on or whatever. You know, I don't know if he's a detective. I don't know who the fuck he is. I've never seen him before in my life. But he's overseeing the operation, making sure that I get, uh, that they, that they intake me. They went through all my shit. I don't know why the fuck I'm even here. And I'm just supposed to forget all of that. I'm supposed to forget being dragged in the middle of the fucking street in Cable Beach, Nassau, Bahamas. 
damn near destroyed my laptop. And the thing that makes me mad about this shit, especially people that tried to hurt me and call me homeless, but you can't even afford a fucking $1,500 MacBook. But you coming for me trying to ruin my shit that you ain't even help me pay for. Cause that's how people do. People will sit up here and try to shit on a career that they didn't even help you fucking build. That they wasn't with you when you was alone in your fucking car praying because you didn't know how you was gonna make it. All because you're a woman and you're attractive and they wanna fuck you and they can't have their way with you. Cause you got self esteem. Man, fuck Nick Cannon. Fuck Ja Rule. Fuck Irv Gotti. Fuck all the motherfuckers who was part of that federal uh, investigation that got fucking Irv Gotti fed time. And they was salty about the shit because it was over 50 cent and they whole little queens beat and that shit with the nigga that snatched the chain but it was way deeper than that and Donald Trump is involved because it's some old queen shit and he's financed a couple of shits because he's a fucking crook. Good job at the impeachment but y'all probably not gonna impeach him because our government is fucking corrupt. So whatever. Fuck 50 baby mama Shaniqua and her ass not wanting to get a motherfucking job. Uh... And she was trying to live off them fucking child support checks. He was paying her $500,000 a year in child support. She had a baby by another motherfucker that wasn't even him. Now, that was her oldest child, but she wanted 50 to pay for all three of them. And that's why he took her ass to court and got it reduced to 20000 He told me, he was like, he went to court and the judge was like, y'all, y'all not the three musketeers. She's only, he only responsible for Marquise. He ain't got to pay all this for y'all. And we all saw as fans, as innocent bystanders, you know, they little social media wars and stuff. You know, there's... There's talk like in the industry, you know, about sacrifices of kids and all that other shit. So, you know, there's talk that it was fake or whatever, but no, them niggas was ignorant, him and her. And I told him to his face that was some ignorant nigga shit when I met him. When I had the opportunity to uh, be in his presence and be frank with him. Cause I never felt like I couldn't be honest with him. I really, really always approached him from a place of respect. I always approached him from a place of admiration. I always approached him from a place of, you know, uh, yo, I dig you and I think you dope and wow, I think it's cool that I met you. Hey, you know, I tried flirting and all that stuff. He was flirting too, but you know, like I said, I noticed early that he was shy and I was shy. And I was like, wow, this motherfucker, this motherfucker here? This motherfucker. Dude, I've watched this motherfucker since 03 and yo, Witness all this other stuff, all these petty ass beats, all this stuff, the, the, the shit, niggas shooting at fucking radio stations and all this goofy ass shit, motherfucker getting knifed up, all this rough ass shit y'all doing. <laughs> and he's shy? Really? Wow. I didn't even share that with people because I knew people wasn't shit. That's the thing that makes me angry about how, like, people thwarted, like, the excitement that I did have over him. I didn't really share much, but it was the excitement that I had for it. Now, there was a situation where, you know, later down the line, you know, uh, I saw that he was in support of, you know, sketches that I was making. And I was like, yo, like, and I told him, I was like, yo, I've been watching, you know, I, I peeped, I peeped, one of the things I peeped about what you do that I respect, you know, you know how to strike when the iron is high and build off momentum. I, and I, I you know, I'm making jokes, I'm silly, you know, what the fuck, you know, I, like, I graduated from school to get rich and I try, so, you know, I, 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 I said something stupid, like, I attended get rich and I try university, some shit, like, I'm silly, and I learned, you know, whatever, so this is what I'm gonna do, blah, blah, skippy, 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 and, um, he posted my first one, but he didn't post the second one, and I was like, oh, damn, he didn't think it was funny, damn, or, you know, I was feeling away, and, um, you know, I had rallied up, you know, some comics like, man, you know, I did this one sketch with Frank Kente and he posted it. So, you know, let's do this one. Hopefully we'll post it. It'll be a good look for everybody. I know y'all trying to grow your social media, you know, whatever, whatever. And that totally turned into, you know, a bunch of other stuff like people, you know, uh, okay, this bitch thinks she his friend. It's, you know, all this other stuff. Uh, when really I wasn't, I wasn't too much, it wasn't even like that. It was, to me, right, especially around this period of time, Every, it was, you know, I'm a comedian, and I was surrounded by a gang of comics that, you know, was getting into, like, the Instagram sketches and all this stuff. There was comics that had been doing it, like, for a minute, they had their own following. And, you know, I just, I, I'm a, I, I'd be thinking and shit. I'm like, okay, this is cool. I was like, but if somebody sees it and it's funny, or you, you showing love and you showing pub and they repost it, isn't that what you want? Aren't you trying to get more views? It, you know, in the same instance of, like, getting more customers as a business, you are a business. Your job is to get more customers. Your job is to get work. Your job is to whatever, whatever. So if you're doing this, isn't that the smart thing to do? You know what I'm saying? But you know, motherfuckers is fucking followers, and so they looked at it the wrong way, like they do. But then people started copying. Then people was like, oh, I can get Black China to repost my shit. I can do and You know, they started doing that. And nobody was doing that. And it was like, and I wasn't even mad at people doing it. I was like, yeah, come on, like, duh. But it was the fact that it was me doing it. And then, and that's how it was like, you know, one of those things where I was like, dude. And it made me not want to be around people no more. It was like, because once again, it's, it's me doing it. Just like when I started doing, you know, Velvet Circus and shit. You know, I literally was invited to a motherfucking meeting with this nigga named Jeru. If you in LA, you know who fuck Jeru is. He used to run the comedy store on Tuesdays. Chilling on Tuesdays for a long ass time. Jeru and, um, who Jeru had us? He had us meet at his house. He had us meet with somebody, some producer in Hollywood or whatever. And, you know, he's like, we, we trying to spice up tripping on Tuesdays. And we want to add sketches and we want to add this and that and the third. And I'm looking and I'm like, so y'all basically want to do Velvet Circus? And it was like, no, we, 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 it, 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 it was made it like bullshit, right? They invited me. I got invited to the meeting. I got invited to his house. So you know what I do with Velvet Circus. But then they try to act like they never heard of it and they didn't see it and all that shit. The same thing people do with my Instagram account. It's like... 
And, and, and Drew at one point tried to holler at me. I thought Drew was cute. I thought Drew was cool. But we had no chemistry. He's a nice looking man. Like, I don't, you know, negate that or any of that. We had zero chemistry. And to be honest, he turned me off with how he approached me because he kept trying to big dog talk me. I hate that shit. I don't like anybody trying to big dog talk me. That is not impressive to me. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't care what you can do and what you have. I don't fucking give a shit. Are you a good person? Can we kick it? Can we chill? You know, do we have anything special going on? I can meet anybody who can do things. I'm a, keep, I'm a capable person. I know how to meet other capable people. Whether, you know what I'm saying, whether or not you can function and do dope shit or whatever is irrelevant if I'm talking about a romantic situation. I need to know where you have my back. I need to know real shit. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, uh, the way he approached me, I didn't really kind of like it. So it took a minute for me to even accept a date from him. It took about a year to. I feel like the first time I ever met Drew, I don't know. This was a long ass time ago. I feel like it took a year for me to go on a date to Bar Louis with him. And I just remember being there and being like, eh, if I don't see him again, I won't miss this. And so, you know, that was it. I don't even think I gave him a good, good night kiss or nothing. He probably was salty about that. Because our, our interaction at the comedy store from then on out was always real different. And what am I supposed to do? Like, what do you want me to do? Like, I'm not going to fake it with you for an opportunity. Like, I have faith in my abilities as a comedian. I didn't feel like I had to. You clearly see me coming. So, I'm not wrong. And then years down the line, because Velvet Circus, I started that in 2016. I usually always have, I don't know, it's something about Aries energy. Uh, Aries season is when I be in creation mode. Pretty Girls Aren't Funny, I started that in April of 2012. Uh, Velvet Circus, I started in April of 2011. I started comedy April 1st, 2016. There's something about Aries energy. The God, the God and Goddess of War. I be ready to buck at the world. And then, my plan of expansion, I explained this in the last podcast of the natal charts, how it works. If, uh, according to my natal chart, right? My plan of expansion is Jupiter. And my Jupiter is in Scorpio. Scorpio be like, man, I'm going to make this shit my bitch. What you talking about? Like, Scorpio energy be ready to, to all or nothing. I come here, want to take all. Winner takes everything. Let's get it. Like, that's Scorpio energy. So, you know, I guess it's something about Aries energy. Like, Aries season, like, I'll be ready to come back. Hey, yo, let's go. I'm here. Hey, world, what up? Let's go. You know, um, I, Double Circus was 2011. This meeting that I'm talking about where I got invited to the house, that'd be like, it was late. Yeah, it had to be late 2011. Like, late, late 2011. Yep. Yep, it was late 2011. And so, and, and that date that I was talking about, like, at Bar Louis, that shit was like 2007. So, you know, fast forward almost five years down the line. I'm still around, I'm still doing comedy, I'm grabbing mics, and I'm doing so well to the point that you're inviting me to a meeting with other comedians and this producer to try to make your show that you've been putting on at the comedy store for years hotter. So you end up needing me. Right. Um, I got played like that a lot because people couldn't get what they wanted from me. But, as y'all know, this is the first time I ever mentioned the Drew shit, as long as I've been doing this podcast, as long as I've been, it ain't never came out of my for what? Like, I don't want nothing from him, I'm not trying to get anything out of it, and I ain't even trying to, you know, um, smear his name or no shit. Like, he didn't come at me disrespectfully, he didn't try anything, and here, here, here. I feel like this is divine intervention, like, for me even bringing this up. He didn't try anything. He didn't, you know, overstep his boundaries as a gentleman. None of that. Like, I went on a date with him. He actually took me out and, and you know, like, wanted to show me, you know, a good time or whatever. And we ended up going to Bar Louis um, because we were in Chicago. What happened was, he lives here in L.A. And um, I visited L.A. for the first time June 2007. That's when I met him. I moved to L.A. till October 2008. So the entire time, I lived in Chicago. Okay? Um, June 2007 was the first time I was in L.A. That's where I met him. And, you know, time had passed in the last... I still lived in Chicago until October 20, 2008. It was a whole year later, y'all. Like, so maybe it was, I don't know, it could have been the summertime in Chicago because it wasn't cold out. It might have been the summertime in Chicago. It had been summer 2008 then because it wasn't cold outside. I'll never forget that day because I'm, I'm going to share the story in a second. Okay, yeah, I'm going to share the story. Here's something funny to break up all this, like, negative energy and serious shit. I'll tell you in a second the story. Just, when I say the story, okay. But it happened the same day as the story. I'm going to say that. Now, I was in Chicago and um, I was out partying with my homegirl Jasmine. We went to this, like, some event. I don't know. It was something fly, you know what I mean? And Drew was working the door. And, and then we were in Chicago. And I, like, when we show up to the party, you know me and Jasmine, I'm looking like, what the fuck you doing here? Why you in my city? He was like, and you know, he was acting all light-skinned and shit. He's like, well, you know, I, you know, I be doing things. Oh, really? You be doing things? Why you in my city? What are you doing? He was like, well, you know, we got Louis Vuitton, you know, blah, 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 blah. I was like, oh, okay. He was checking me out. I was checking him out. Blah, blah, blah. And so he was in my city. And uh, he was like, yo, why don't you let me take you out? Why you be playing? Blah, blah, blah. You know, that whole trying to match it. You feel me? We grown. What the fuck? You know? Um, and I wasn't dating anybody. I wasn't in a relationship. I, didn't, I wasn't with anybody. Um, let me put that out. I was single as fuck. Um, so he did all that, or whatever, and I was like, all right, what you like? I'll go, he's like, all right, I'll pick you up tomorrow, you know, whatever, whatever. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, so this was the day before, the date, right? And, you know, we did all of that. I'll pick you up tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. So, the day of, I'll never forget it because it was the same day as the story. So I did this birthday party, y'all. It was, like, literally one of the most ghetto shit I've ever partaken in. Uh, simply because, but this happens a lot in black comedy. It just, you know, you have to... <sighs> Black people love to laugh. We love throwing comedy shows. We love throwing things. But people just don't like paying comedians in the acts. They, you know, really think this shit is free or whatever. So, you know, this dude was throwing this birthday party for his wife, honoring his wife. And this motherfucker booked, like, 12 comedians. Why? I don't know. I don't know why he thought that was a good idea. You know what I'm saying? Because all 12 of us got to be paid. Like, why? You know, but he was just like, man, this person's funny, this person's funny, this person's funny. I want them to perform for my wife and make her feel special for her birthday. Right? Okay. So it was in a backyard or whatever in the south suburbs. And, you know, um, I agreed to, like, uh, 10 minutes or whatever for, like, $100 or some shit. But I know my, my, for this 
particular gig or whatever my, my fee was like $100. Now, mind you, this is 2007. I started comedy in 2006. Just want to put that out there. Okay, great. So, like 10 minutes, $100, left, whatever. Okay, cool. So, I do my time and I got this date with Drew. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm ready to go. Because, you know, we did a whole, yo, I'll meet you at this time. I'll pick you up, blah, blah, blah. I had somewhere to be. You feel me? So, I want my motherfucking money. Okay? I did my, sh- I did my time. I performed. I'm ready to go. And the owner of the house, also the husband of the birthday girl, was the dude I went to look for for my money. And, you know, he was faking moves and shit. He was, like, faking all kind of moves. And I was like, yo, what, what's good? What, you know, let me get my money. He was like, uh, give me a second. I got to go uh, wash these dishes. Like, he was just, he was like, faking. Like, he just was coming up with shit. Uh, no, come on, but I really got to. And now, hold on, I got to walk the dog. Like, nigga, wait, give me my money. You know what I'm saying? So, um, shout out to Tasha Smith. I think I brought this up before. But, you know, um, she did an interview on TV One. And I just never heard female comics talk about this before. But it was, like, the realest thing ever. You know, uh... A lot of black shows, you know, which kind of, you know, deter us from, that's why we, you know, want to be mainstream and we want to throw our own stuff and that's why we end up doing cruise ships and colleges and shows where the money is guaranteed because you run into all this bullshit that can be avoidable, right? If people were just good business people, right? But the thing about it is, you know, people feel like they don't have to pay the comic and because men will beat their ass, you know, they'll pay them, but when it comes to women, they try to be forceful with us and try to bully us and shit. And so this motherfucker tried to bully me like he wasn't going to pay me. And I just, I wasn't with it. Like, I'm a little firecracker. I'm, I'm a little pit bull. You gonna give me my motherfucking money. I don't know the fuck. Nigga, I got three Libra placements in my chart. Libra don't play. Give me that money. So, um, we gonna get our paper. Okay, what? So, um, I followed him around. I was like, yeah, but whenever you get done with that, I'm gonna need this $100. Like, I, I, I agreed to do the show. I did the show. They laughed. They had a great time. Pay me my money. Like, I, I'm not your friend. I don't... You know, I'm glad you think... I'm, I'm listen. If you're trying try to pay me, pay me all these damn compliments. Man, that was real funny, bitch. I don't get paid in compliments. I'm glad you think I'm funny. I'm honored that I can make your wife laugh and feel special on a day, but this is what I do. That's why I do this. I do this. Like, don't, like, a compliment ain't shit. I do this. That's insulting. Like, I do this. So you're going to treat me and pay me like the professional that I am. And he just was, uh, coming up, oh, shit. Oh, I got to go to the bathroom. Like, he was just coming up with all kind of bullshit. So then he was like, uh, then he snapped at me. He yelled at me. And I was like, oh, you going to lower your motherfucking voice and go get my money. I don't have it. Oh, you got to find it. Somebody robbed me. He really went there. Somebody robbed me. Somebody, I put it in a drawer and somebody went in the house and took it out of the drawer. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like a personal problem. I'm going to need you to go to ATM. How you throw this party and why you get all these comedians and you ain't have us? First of all, I was like, a really professional environment. You pay me before I hit the stage because the money's guaranteed. You had it, right? All right? Somebody stole from me. Like, he did all that. And so, uh, he was making moves. It was another comedian. Shout out to Rodney Lumpkins. Uh, Rodney Lumpkins is like six foot five. Tall, but skinny, tall nigga. Okay? Uh, looked like he played for the Bulls back in the day, but not really. Okay? Uh, in fact, he got a bunch of funny jokes about every tall nigga ain't good at basketball. It's hilarious. Okay? Google Rodney Lumpkins. He's a Chicago comedian. He's hilarious. Okay, anyway. Rodney, who is a, a father a husband, and Rodney has a business. Like, he, you know, comedy is something he does because he loves it. And, you know, he's, he's really funny, for real. You know, he's funny, and he loves it. So he does it because he loves it, but it, it's not his, you know, his thing. You know, he, he um, well, I don't know what he's doing now. This was 2007, y'all, okay? But, you know, Rodney drove uh, a Lexus. Rodney had a family. Rodney was a husband. Rodney made money. And, you know, he was a, a classy guy. He's a gentleman, you know, um, uh, professional. You know, he had tact. You know, you, I'm just trying to paint a picture, you feel me? So Rodney, he wasn't ignorant. He's not disrespectful, you feel me? He just, he's just a professional. He, he, he carries himself and has that swag of business is business and per our agreement. Like, yeah, he's one of the niggas that say per our agreement. Like, he's, he's you know, feel, you feel me? That's his line, okay? Okay. I just, I'm trying to paint the picture so y'all can, I want y'all to be with me around the family. Okay, now. So Ronnie finishes his jokes and it's the same thing. It's like, all right, you know, uh, hey, sir, you know, cool. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm gonna need that. I gotta get back to my kids type of deal, right? And he was giving him the B-Box. Like, he was giving me the B-Box. And Ronnie hit him with the prior agreement. You know, he's talking that talk, right? And he's like, uh, that's really not acceptable, my brother. So, you know, uh, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to wait. And you do what you got to do to go get the money. Now, that is two against one. That dude is trying to act like he hustling to get the money a little bit, right? And he was like, all right, well, let me call my brother-in-law. Because uh, I didn't really want to leave the party. But he's like, uh, let me see if I can send him to the, you know, uh, if I can send him to the stuff. Like, it was something. He was just faking moves and shit. So Ronnie was like, uh, actually, if you go into the ATM, how about this? I'll go with you. I'll follow you there. And Ronnie, I'll make sure you get your money. It's all good. It's no harm, no foul. Probably an honest mistake. Ronnie's one of those guys. You see what I'm saying? Probably an honest mistake. You know, you got a lot going on. I see you want to make your wife feel special. I understand. I'm a husband as well. I love my wife. You know, I get it. Things happen. Like, Ronnie was doing all of this, y'all. Okay? Dude was still faking moves. I was like, yeah. And I was, trying, I was holding my tongue. I was like, yeah, okay, cool. So, um, uh, Pause. I need to address this right now because of what happened at 24 Hour Fitness that I put on Facebook. Somebody's texting me right now talking about I got warned, but there's a motherfucker that walked in the Starbucks that I'm in with a 24 Hour Fitness uniform. Fuck you. And that's why I email corporate about y'all. Yeah, it's in the podcast now too, bitch. Text me one more time. I'm about to email corporate and let them know that you text me. Yeah. Stay off my social media and stop stalking me. Anyway, so uh, this is what's going on. And there was another comedian named Freeman Brown. Freeman is muscular. Now, Freeman is built. You feel me? Freeman, you know, you look at them and you don't want those problems, okay? So, you know, I'm trying to, you know, get my money. I'm being patient or whatever. Dude said something all the way disrespectful to me. And I was like, oh, hell no. Free! Free, get over here. I called free over free, ran up. Like, man, this is why I don't have a whole lot of patience for guys that don't have that instinct to protect women. I really don't. 
I don't have no type of patience for it. Uh, a guy that just doesn't have that in him will never be somebody that I look at it in the long term. It's what ended my very first relationship I was ever in when I was in comedy. Just a guy that doesn't have that awareness to be like, wait, what are you saying to the lady? What, what's on? Like, you know? Um, and Free was just, I went to high school with Free's sister. You know what I'm saying? So Free looked at me like one of his young sisters. You feel me? So Free, yo, what's going on? He's like, why you ain't got people money? And like, dude was so shook at Free. He hopped on this scooter with another nigga. <laughs> And grabbed the dude. <laughs> like, hey, he tapped him or something. Hey, hey, let's, let's go get that money. <laughs> he did all of that. I don't, like, this is truth. Free showed up and Free wasn't having it. And I don't, like, and like I said, Free and Lil Bill. Free walked right up and was like, yo, what's going on? Why you don't have these people money? And he, he was so shook, he jumped on the scooter and, and clutched the dude who, who was trying to, and he was like, hey, hey, let's, let's, let's go get that money. We got paid. And that's what I had to go through before the date. Yeah, because my life, my life in the sunshine. I say all that to say, you know, not everybody that approaches me with interest outside of comedy, you know, they, they're interested in me, approaches me in, in, um, uh, in inappropriately. And I'm not some thirsty trying to get on bitch that look, I'm looking for opportunity. Because, like, keeping it a thousand, dude, Jeru House was in the hills, okay? When I stayed with Dion, we stayed in a studio apartment in Westwood together. He wasn't even in a one bedroom. I don't have to lie on Dion to be important. Rail couldn't even afford none of that shit. I used to waitress at Leona's on 111th and Western, and I would come to the West Side to bring his family food because they was uh, all they would do was eat food from the gas station. They would eat like you know like non-nutritious foods, foods from the gas station and like the um, Chinese food place up the street. And everybody lived together in that apartment with his parents. I ain't got a lot of kick it. Everybody that I ever spent time with, I made them better. Everybody. I'm amusing this motherfucker, and I know that. The problem is, it took me a minute to have full confidence in myself when it came to this because I was met with so much opposition, so much toxic, uh, toxicity, you know, so much non-supportive energy. You know what I'm saying? Where it was like, it took me a minute to really feel myself and be like, fuck that and fuck y'all. It took a minute. I'm there, but it took a while. And I'm getting mighty tired of your trifling ways and of listening to that jackass bray.